episode 29, Life's Learning Curve. Hello, everybody. I'm Paul Hart, and welcome to Life's Learning Curve, the podcast. My background is I, I come from video production and from education, and I've done a lot of writing and researching throughout my life for documentaries and films and that type of thing. So in my life, I've gotten to wear many hats. I'm a father of two great kids, a son, a brother, a teacher. I've played music. I'm creator of uh, videos of many, many amazing flavors, as I like to say. And if you put all that in the pot and stir it up together, you've got pretty much what my life is. So here in the podcast, we find ourselves trying to make that discovery of just how we became us, and sometimes the best us. They picked me out of the crowd. A lot of people could learn lessons from our parents' generation. You know, fill your rooms up with people that love you, folks. Daddy was going running like a wild dog. From childhood, all your stories, you remember telling them at a shorter height. We would actually run like crazy through the fields. Remember being a kid? in summertime. Filleted my shin open down to the muscle. It was, learning was a fun thing for me. My special particular tropical destination. Today, I'm taking you all on my own quest for a very personal destination in my life. We're gonna talk about my longing for adventure, for love, and it has to be in some distant tropical latitude somewhere. Now this search took me practically 40 years of my life to be realized, and I did finally realize it. The adventure along the way actually helped create a better version of me. So how did you become this version of you? Huh? (laughs) Subscribe and you may discover some of the people, some of the experiences, the events that built your character. It's a pretty awesome thing to do when you think about it. So, let's get it going. Sebastian. This is Life's Learning Curve. I'm Paul Hart. Today's episode, Can't Explain Paradise. Stand by. Ever since I've been a child, I've always had that longing for adventure and love someplace special. And I determined early on it was going to be distant from my home and it would be a tropical latitude. My vision was precise, and it was very one of a kind. kind. When I was a kid, I wrote these short fiction stories and had this imagination that took me lots of places in my head. So growing up, I did see these movies on television, replays of movies like Key Largo, The Maltese Falcon, Casablanca, and I read Jack Kerouac's On the Road book from cover to cover two times which is a story about, uh, it's about a lot of things, but there are these two guys and they are discovering just how to enjoy the best possible life. I didn't know where this tropical destination was when I was young, but I needed to find it sometime in my life. And I would most assuredly know when I got there. Why? I'll know. Well. My assumptions when I was young was there'd be a lot of Humphrey Bogart type characters milling around along with these Peter Lorre guys conning their way through their existence. <laughs> there'd be tremendous, this sounds kind of silly now that I think about it, but when I was little it made total sense to me. There'd be this tremendous like heat, it was warm and there would be men wearing these wrinkled seersucker suits. Always a plot twist somewhere and as well as everything would kind of look like film noir. Now, film noir uh, films consist of uh, cynical heroes. Think of Casablanca, if you can. Stark lighting effects, heavy contrast, frequent use of flashbacks in these real intricate plots. And there was always this underlying existentialist philosophy where in the film you'd see all these characters with will and consciousness as being in this tropical location but they don't actually know what they need or they can't find it so they're just happy to be where they're at also in 1976 a performer named Al Stewart wrote a song called You're the Cat 
The gist of this song is you have this main character, our protagonist, a tourist right off the tour bus, and he's visiting this exotic, tropical, remote market when a mysterious, silk-clad, beautiful woman appears and takes him away for a tropical, romantic adventure. He wakes up the next day beside her, and the tourist, our protagonist, realizes with a great deal of calmness and confidence that his tour bus is left without him, and he's lost his ticket so he's going to have to stay for a while. He is not thrown by this, huh? So very calmly, he's accepting his own existentialism and addiction for adventure. Now, it wasn't a heavy rocker, but the song's lyrics spoke to me. I'm a kid, I'm sitting there, and I hear this great progression of of piano chords followed by the lyrics on a morning from a Bogart movie. Yeah. In a country where they turn back time. Yeah. You go strolling through the crowd like Peter Lorre. Yeah. Contemplating a crime. Are you kidding me? That's great. It's exactly what I'm looking for. Not contemplating a crime, but there's broad characters all around. Very visual, the song was. I can't play the song because of copyright issues, but please look it up on YouTube or whatever place you find your music spotify apple music etc you're the cat by al stewart my quest for this destination seemed imperative in my life when i was younger i needed to do this and it would be my quest throughout my life find this place i could not wait to go farther and farther south in the united states of america My family vacationed once a year in a place called Biloxi, Mississippi, where I saw much of these newly desired surroundings, beach cabanas, uh, beach cafes, kind of shitty looking characters hanging around in the perimeters, blue aqua crystal waters, gulf shores, breezes, salty sea captains pulling their fishing hodges into the back bay to unload and hose off. However, there was not the foreboding adventure, at least within the local mall or Coney Duck stand my family frequented. Oh, my parents were keeping us safe. Okay, I get why we weren't fine in those places. But I loved our family getaways. But I always wondered if my mom or dad yearned to see the things I was thinking about as well. I knew I needed to get farther south. I had seen on maps a place called Florida. You know, in school you studied geography. Florida, pretty far south. I hoped and I prayed that I might get there sometime soon in my life. We took a four day trip to Orlando, Florida in December, a few years later, and it was cold when we got there. I was kind of surprised that the climate was jacket weather. And I thought to myself, maybe I'm just not far enough south. Well, singer, songwriter, author, composer, Jimmy Buffett, once sang the lyric to paraphrase his song, The Pascalula Run. It's time to see the world. It's time to kiss a girl. It's time to cross that wild meridian. Grab a bag and take a chance. There's more, but there you go. Grab a bag, take a chance. My longing for adventure in a tropical land did not actually rear its face again until I had the opportunity to do an internship while in college in the small Central American country of Costa Rica. Costa Rica. My final year of undergrad school. This would be where my internship took place. It was 1979 and the tourist trade had not yet overfilled the country's borders. It turned out I loved this small Central American country. It was situated in the skinny part of Central America. It was about the size of West Virginia, the entire country. To come to Costa Rica as a worker slash tourist was 
a true exceptional treat. Tourists were not there yet. Yes, the climate was warm and tropical and the breezes were balmy. In the jungle, everything was supersized, I found out, from the insects being way bigger to fruit-bearing trees having massive fruit. The existentialism of the people was prevalent everywhere. So much life, so much love, so much talent, and yet the country's people had lived in sort of a vacuum doing one thing or just their daily rituals. It might be just women who hauled water from one place to another. They start in the morning and come back in the evening. They hauled water. Or maybe it was the mayor of a small town, also the social director of a small town. The town was practically invisible, I remember, but the guy just hung out and waited for people to show up and they never did. Now the first adventure probably in Costa Rica was a time we took a car way up into the mountains, actually a volcano, and we drove past the volcanoes to get to the beach on the west coast of Costa Rica. I found the waters of the Pacific Ocean to be dark blue, clean down there, clear. Natural springs abounded out of the ground, everywhere. If you looked, there was a natural spring coming up. That water was clean, pure, and it was volcano-warmed water, earth water. These were springs from which you could drink, I was told, and I did. Flowers bloomed with bright colors and grand in size. Orchids were everywhere and abundant and grew very well in this climate. And there was this floral smell everywhere in the country. I realized how unique and special this experience was for me and my team of co-interns. Not yet burdened by all the tourism, the native Costa Rican people were always friendly. They were accommodating and they wanted to know a lot about America. I realized then that the United States of America was their distant latitude. I would like to live there. So one day we drove to the beach far from our tiny Costa Rican city of Tibas. I looked out the car window and I saw this boy around age 10 just walking you know, casually down a dirt road. And as he took each step, his right foot kicked a soccer ball straight up in the air. Maybe, I don't know, 20, 30 feet. It was amazing. He never looked at it. It allowed him to take three more steps. He kicked it so high. Before he did this again and again, <laughs> he never looked at this ball. This God-given gift was just as natural as walking for this local Tico from Costa Rica. Amazing talent from a boy who probably didn't even realize his gift. When we arrived at the beach, the local children were playing soccer near us. And they played maybe for six hours. The entire six hours we were there. But they were so happy just doing that one thing. And behind the soft sandy beach where we sat was a jungle. I'm not saying just a few palm trees and a road and some stores. No, there was the jungle. It was a jungle. It was thick and you couldn't get through it. That's just a few palm trees. And an actual, you know, there were actual animals around. We had to look out for the giant six to seven foot um, lizards. And they might be called something different down there, but I just remember them looking like giant lizards. Iguanas. <laughs> they were colorful. They were molting skin all the time. And they would emerge out of the jungle and all of a sudden they would be right next to our belongings grabbing a hat, eating the hat, and walking away or picnic food or whatever. I even found a really bright and fun girlfriend when I was in the country. She was Costa Rican, but she spoke Costa Rican and she spoke English. Very good, helpful. Uh, I did notice that though there was a lot of rum and it flowed quite freely every night. But the families all did things together. They went out to places called, they called them discos, but they were bars that played music. Even the grandpas and the grandmas went out with the families to the discotheques. It was a great six month internship and I have to admit how surprised I was that this was like an unplanned adventure and things unraveled very nicely during that time frame. 
However, there was a dark side to the country. It lacked some of the humanity I was hoping for. Some men and boys carried sidearms, guns on them, and, and they were loaded. We were told never to walk through certain areas of town at night. Even if they look nice in the daytime, you don't go through those areas. And at night, in the vague distance, you could hear rebels from Nicaragua to the north coming across the border into Costa Rica and exchanging gunfire. This wasn't the USA. The police squad had World War II jeeps with machine guns hooked to the back, mounted to the back. And if you disobeyed a traffic uh, stop sign or something, the police could never catch you because the gear ratio on those jeeps was so low that they never could go probably faster than 28 miles per hour. My reality was that this tropical adventurism easily might become an unintentional realized casualty for me if I wasn't careful. For example, I was robbed at gunpoint the last weekend I was there. They took my 35 millimeter camera and a roll of uh, 36 photos with 34 taken. Lost it. Yes, adventurous. Yes, stupidly dangerous for me. There will certainly be a podcast on Costa Rica in the near future. So much happened. Good. And not so good. Time passed quickly in Costa Rica. That was cool. And on the day I was to fly back to Chicago, O'Hare Airfield, I woke up to one eye that would not open. Apparently I had bitten by one of those gigantic mosquitoes like this big, uh, and my hands are about a foot apart, that used to dance on our walls at night. I don't know what bit me. Anyway, my eyelids, upper and lower, swelled to such a large circumference uh, that I couldn't put sunglasses on. They wouldn't fit. They were, it, 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 it was larger than my nose. So I had to say goodbye to all my new Costa Rican friends at the airport and my Costa Rican girlfriend as they looked at my face and I kept remember seeing these looks of horror. I looked like some kind of a monster. So there were no uh, goodbye photos <laughs> taken that day. Yeah. <laughs> as graduate school filled my nights and education and teaching filled my days, I went through a time frame where I felt perhaps what I had was a book, a book in me that I needed to get out. The characters were beginning to develop on their own. My visions of a tropical adventure were very particular and very precise. This might not be a reality, but rather be a visual piece of imagery surrounded by characters and a plot line. I was just trying to understand myself at the time in the world that I lived in. And I used the writing process as the way to try and understand that. Time and time again in my 20s, this was a time full of painful self-discoveries as it is for a lot of people. So the truth was about getting closer and closer to the essence, whether I could access it through drawing, through music, through writing, a fiction book. I needed to transcend self-pity. I got married, and just prior to having children, I began to feel that longing for adventure in some tropical distant latitude somewhere once again. It was just a dream. But in 1983, I was given a record album by someone, I can't remember who, and the title was called One Particular Harbor, which was also the title track by Jimmy Buffett. 12 Volt Man was also a song that resonated with me. Both songs spoke of this special unique place which Jimmy could go to recharge, uh, meet the locals, dream, create, relax. 
in interviews, people have asked Jimmy Buffett where his one particular harbor is. Where is this special place? And to paraphrase Jimmy Buffett, he always says, I've heard him a few times say, well, I know where my one particular harbor is. It's up to you to go out and find yours, which is a great answer. Absolutely, and I still needed to find mine, my one particular harbor. The years that followed, I traveled, and I traveled a lot. I've searched St. Martin, Punta Cana, Grand Cayman, the west coast cities of Big Sur, Carmel-by-the-Sea, San Francisco, and Nevada's Red Rock Canyon in the desert. I was searching for something. We took a couple of family cruises to the Eastern Caribbean and found my family of four in St. Thomas one day. And then we took a ferry boat over to Cruise Bay in the island of St. John. Wow. We could not stay there for more than just a few hours. There were no cruise ship ports there. Just quiet isolation, birds, nature. But I rented a small boat when I got there, and we circumnavigated the island of St. John. My family and I met very kind locals and drank in the vistas. That's a great way to, to say it because it was like having a really cool, delicious drink. And the small island culture of St. John. No cruise ship ports there. Nope. Just quiet isolation and nature. Nice that had kept this island pristine and the island locals full of flavor and eccentricities. <laughs> Three quick encounters on St. John. One, I met a man who just kept talking to me and kept talking to me as if he were selling me a car in uh, at a roadless country. I know that's unusual, but it was just a guy that had huge dreams that was limited by his existence on the island of St. John's. I know I want to run a tech company. I love tech, but we have no technology. At least they didn't at that time. I was kind of the reverse of him, I realized. Two, I spoke with an American couple who are now the new superintendents of schools on the small island of St. John. Although the husband had two crossed eyes, we had a clear vision conversation about island life, transitions from the United States to a small island, and the differences in education of St. John compared to the United States. He gave me his business card and offered me a position that next school year. Imagine teaching on St. John, I wondered. But the downside was very, very, very low pay, almost poverty, and teachers relied on handouts to get by. Three, I spent a good deal of the day on one of many, many uninhabited beaches in which my family loved playing in the Caribbean aqua clear waters and the quiet natural ocean waves, the palm trees swaying, my two kids and my wife adapted to a fun, a creative, very imaginative play and communication with all four of us just thriving in this great one-of-a-kind location. We were doing something beyond special together and I think we all knew it. We were having our own adventure. Now that was a day I wish I could relive again. That one adventure in St. John grabbed my heart and it's never let go. I had reached my one particular harbor. It happened, but just for a small moment in time, a very abbreviated adventure. You know, if you hold sand too tightly, it'll fall through your fingers. That's my metaphor for St. John. Can't explain paradise. In 2002, I wanted to plan a vacation. What is the southernmost point in the continental United States? It's thought to be Key West, Florida. Key West is the southernmost city in the United States, yet only 90 miles from Cuba. Didn't want to go to Cuba at the time, but 90 miles away by ocean. 
the drive from Miami to Key West is very unique. The overseas highway actually leaves the southernmost tip of the continent and begins taking these islands and bridges on a scenic coastal overseas highway called A1A, made famous by the Jimmy Buffett song, No Way to Reason with Hurricane Season. Once again, can't play it, copyright issues. But look it up, it's called No Way to Reason with Hurricane Season. The drive passes through some 40 plus islands before reaching Key West. You pass through some of the most breathtaking scenery in the world that you'll ever see. Now, Highway A1A was built on top of the base of train tracks, which had a very short life. They were destroyed in the 1930s by a hurricane, and they built a road on top of the train tracks bed. At last, that summer, we found ourselves headed for the small town of Key West, population around 24,000 or so. As I began my drive down A1A Highway, something very unusual happened to me. I didn't expect it. I slowly relaxed. I saw a lot of new things, but this was different. Every thought left my head, which involved stress, tension, work issues, home issues. What was happening? It was like a magic kind of portal for me. These days, it is 20 years later since I went through the first time, and it still happens to me when A1A ends and I find myself in Key West. Ah, nice. Funny, because my original mental image of Key West was uh, practically a still shot in my head. I saw a warm, breezy lone lifeguard house next to a giant communications tower. Kind of like a tropical North Pole or something. But I was wrong. It was a small city. With Duval Street as its main street, the island measures about one mile by four miles. Yes, there are cruise ships there. And a tiny international airport just beginning to land some larger jets these days. There's a naval air station, and former President Harry S. Truman had a winter White House there he liked to go to. It's still there, and it's open for tours. But back in 2002, pulling up into town by a rental car, I immediately had questions. Why did these locals come here to live? Why is it so laid back? Why did people come here? Was it because they had some great need to be this far away from the rest of the United States? After all, this is the end of the road, literally. If you went any farther, you just drive in the ocean. Tourists come here for different reasons. Most come for deep sea fishing, beautiful, warm, tropical, breezy climates, and beaches and fresh catch seafood. Oh yeah, the people. Also, yes, the people. These people are uncommon. These are the square pegs and the round holes type of people, outside of the box thinkers. I made one Google search prior to coming to Key West, going through the things to do or things to see portion of the interweb search. I came up with one place I had a strong desire to visit. It was a store. The name of the store was just three words, but I was intrigued by those three words. This store title brought up imagery of Casablanca, of Indiana Jones. Oh yeah, that's where I wanted to go, yeah. Adventures, uh, the immediacy, the feeling for living life now, before it's too late. The store I have mentioned before in this podcast, and the owner of this store is an author and was featured in my very first episode of Life's Learning Curve, episode one. The store was called Last Flight Out. But as we all know, a store name means absolutely nothing without the depth of concept. The owner's name of the store was an author named Clay Greger. When I came into Last Flight Out the very first time, I remember there were other people in the store, but I heard this voice call out, and I wasn't sure he was calling to me, but he was. 
And he says, uh, I heard this voice say, Come on in! Where are you from? I walked up to the counter. And within minutes, I was sitting on an extra stool next to Clay near the counter. Deep in conversation, two hours passed for us, and uh, I began to feel uneasy because I felt, I felt change. I felt possibilities. This is strange. I felt a strong, promising hope deep inside me. Who was this guy? What was he saying? Nothing directly, actually. We were talking about life and stories and decisions and mentors and things like that. Was my life beginning to modify itself? Here was a man I had just met who had never, ever told people what to do or what to buy from his store, or he never gave advice. But rather, what he did was he had written and experienced a lot in life. And he wrote about it. That day we talked about a lot of different topics, and I think, you know, we were talking about some topic like facing each day or the drudgery of day-to-day work, and I remember Clay just stopped and he grinned, looked at me, and he reached over and hit Control-P, and he printed out a story on his printer and he said to me read this tonight before we go to bed and come in tomorrow and tell me what you think I loved that he didn't say you've got to go read this or I need you to read this or read this he said you know if you feel like it if you can read this see what you think (laughs) yeah I love that No one ever passively ever challenges you in life. Almost never. A challenge is a throwing down the gauntlet. This is a passive challenge. Liked it. Clay always seems to do this. By the way, I immediately began doing the same concept, using that same concept, that passive challenge in my teaching in education. So in teaching in the classroom, The brightest kids couldn't get enough of that learning type of challenge. And the other students learned how to think more critically because of this. And they began to learn from the other kids. I love when kids learn from each other. They seem to listen just a little bit better. It was beautiful. It was a great learning situation. And kids love this type of learning. All right, but back in 2002 when I left Last Flight Out that first time, I'd been there two hours, and I walked into the warm, breezy, tropical evening climate, deep in thought. And after just a few days, I realized that many of the locals here were diverse. They were highly intelligent, highly creative, or they were tremendously engaging people. These were unique people. And after just one week vacationing in Key West, I knew I would be back. One day, I walked into Last Flight Out and Clay asked me, what you thinking about these days? My first thought was, well, no one has asked me that question since my mom asked me that when I was about 14. I never imagined anyone actually cared about my thoughts or what I was thinking about anymore. Not true. For some of those people living in Key West, this island was unique. I realized that my trek was not only about an adventure and tropical location, but also my mental state of mind, how I saw people, and what we all do to encourage and to help others grow. Kind of a give and get scenario. Another day, Clay asked me another question, which was something, again, that had not occurred to me. Ball. Can you work in this town? I've known of 50 some people who sold everything and they came to Key West to do their thing. You know, might be real estate, might be a city manager, might be a long haul trucker, whatever. And very, very few of them succeeded. They wound up going home penniless. This island will eat you up. Whether it's the alcohol, the beautiful climate, the vacation destination, they're all very intoxicating. 
very few can just up and work here. I had the answer to that question a year later. I featured Clay as the main character and main on-camera host and talent for a motivational video I produced in Key West and it was on being the best person you can be. Learning to be the best person you can be. You can see that correlation in this podcast. I shot exteriors on the island as a positive metaphor for our content and as I worked I realized that I could work among the tourists and vacationers without distraction. This tropical island has housed some famous and diverse people from author Ernest Hemingway and playwright Tennessee Williams and many others but I feel the lesser known islanders are really the true diverse foundation of this tropical paradise. I have many more stories about Clay and I have many more stories about Key West but I'll just leave a few bullet points that help me confidently claim Key West as my one particular harbor, my special place that I go to where I can relax, create, and learn. Point. Two times I returned to Key West to work in Clay's store. I volunteered to work in Clay's store so he could write content for a contracted book that he was creating. I loved sitting in his store, working his store, being a regular town person for a few weeks, chatting up tourists, writing content behind the counter on my computer, and trying my best to learn how to sell and move inventory. It was new, it was a, it was a brand new challenge. Was I meant to do that? I don't think so. I don't think I was. I did it and I enjoyed it. I recall getting something called the conch discount. If you live in Key West or if you're born here, you're called a conch. A conch is a type of a sea snailed mollusk with meat inside. You can eat the meat. So the conch discount, if people realize that you live here or you work here, sometimes you get the conch discount. It's about 10 15% off. I recall getting a conch discount on crab at Shorty's on Duval Street. And also, I remember I got amazing seafood at TJ's Clam Shack. Point. Locals helped me shoot two documentaries in town. In 2004 was one, in 2014 another. These people were people that believed in the proactive messages which I was aspiring to communicate through these documentaries. And they donated their time and sweat as we usually shot in the pure sun and our characters were in the shade. So cameras were in the sun. Point. One night I was so filled with production ideas. I left my hotel room and sleeplessly walked the town for the rest of the night, grinning from ear to ear, probably looking really silly, but I had ideas and they were coming hard and fast. And I was only stopping to chat up uh, late night people coming out of bars or to jot down notes. Being in Key West was like turning on a fast-running faucet in my brain. New concepts, show ideas, production solutions were brimming that night. I wish they would brim that way all the time. That one night brainstorming in Key West actually, truthfully, kept my business, my production video business company, in business for the next couple of years. True. So as I said today, in the open for the show, ever since I've been a child, I've always had that longing for adventure and love in some distant tropical latitude somewhere. My vision was very precise for some reason and very one of a kind. I wrote short fiction stories as a kid and this imagination that I had took me places in my head and it made me want to inspire others to get out, look around, and be somebody for somebody. When I built a documentary in 2014, our storyline was still unraveling. It wasn't over yet. Involved were things like conning, gaslighting, 
and quite a bit of deception that was a part of this documentary piece we were doing. I was looking at the process for the documentary, not the actual people. However, when we were in flux, waiting for things to happen, for the conclusion, without knowing it, I can only guess that I probably stumbled upon something much bigger by accident. Some higher ups in the shadier part of town were being poked and prodded by our documentaries, questions, and they didn't like it. I didn't know. To this day, I have no idea who or what nerve we pinched in town. All I can tell you is that I began to get phone threats to hurt my children back home in the mid-Midwest, and it became obvious these threats were serious. When I was notified my daughter's whereabouts in Illinois while I worked in Key West, the adventurous part of me thought no longer than a split second. This documentary was not worth risking any part of my family or getting physically hurt or threatened. It was my passive Jim Rockford choice. Remember the Rockford Files? I did the right thing by calling it off and taking a terrible financial loss. Days later, I consulted Clay. He was not involved in this documentary, but I kept him updated. His response was classic, classic Clay. He said, I always kind of thought this documentary read more like a comedy. I would have made a comedy out of this. You have so many supposed bright people making terrible choices in this documentary. Look at Paul, nobody could be this ridiculous and dumb. It took me a while, but within a month, I agreed with him. My film noir documentary did come later, and its content was entirely different. The subject matter was different. I guess you could call it an art film, artsy for the closest film festival. Can't explain That's all good. Finally, the one thing I haven't addressed, love. I have great news. I have brought my fiance to town two times in the past three years, and I've gotten to spend some quality time in the town I love with the girl that I love. You know, life does look different when you are longing for adventure, an a, a enhanced state of mind, and love in some distant tropical latitude is finally realized. I've always wrestled with trying to figure out or define or explain my strong need for escapism or finding paradise. It always seems to be someplace else, over there. It's, it's a day's sail away, it's a car ride away. But you know, it's a funny thing, trying to get away and find your own paradise, escapism. You can go far and you can go wide and you can keep moving on and on through places and throughout the years, but you don't escape your own life. You gotta come back to that. The car on the road of life sometimes takes almost an entire lifetime to arrive. But when it does, welcome home. <laughs> For Life's Learning Curve, I'm Paul Hart. Subscribe to Life's Learning Curve at lifeslearningcurve.org and leave a review on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or Podchaser. Life's Learning Curve podcast is put together by producer Paul Hart with assistance by Sarah Derbe, Pepper Harrison, and Sebastian T. Dog. We're mixed by Ariel Stratton, technical director Heidi Cerner. As always, music and audio, Riley Hart. Please visit our website and subscribe. It's lifeslearningcurve.org. Find us practically everywhere you listen to podcasts and also on today's show, some voices were digitally enhanced for entertainment purposes. I'm Paul Hart, and we will be back soon with more stories from Life's Learning Curve. 
We're clear. We're clear. We're clear.